it's a pleasure to be here. Truly, truly honored. Um, <clears throat> and thank you so much to go to conference for again having me. I'm glad that uh, you know we were able to to make the time and make this <laughs> make this happen. Um, <clears throat> so for 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 me, uh, I realized that this is you guys' last conference or last um <clears throat> excuse me again. Uh, this is your last um, keynote of the day. So I've decided to move away from the traditional uh, slide deck. Um, so I won't be making a formal presentation. Again, this is more of a, a Q&A where I offer the opportunity to ask me questions uh, throughout this conversation. Please just drop it in the chat box um, and I will uh, respond just throughout. Just I'll stop, I'll see it, and I'll respond to it. Um, again, if I do not know something, <laughs> I will tell you that I don't know it. Um, I won't go into too much detail about it. I'll just kind of <clears throat> we, we can have a discussion on it. That's really what you want to do. Um, but first off, again, uh, so honored to be here. My name is Kenneth Harris II. Uh, everyone calls me Kenny, though. I have been an engineer with NASA, uh, specifically Goddard Space Flight Center, since I was 16 years old. Um, to put it as a reference, I'm now 28. Uh, and it's been such an amazing, amazing journey. And I'm excited to, send, to, to you know, share this, this pretty unique um, in my opinion, story and, and how I got to where I am and, and to really ask the question of, um, you know, what does it take to be an engineer? What does it take to, um, you know, get these mentors, mentee relationships and ultimately to improve your career to the next level? Um, <clears throat> so, so throughout this conversation, I'll be talking about, uh, so uh, take a step back, sorry. <clears throat> I have worked on I'm working on my seventh, my seventh satellite mission now over, like I said, that past 12, 13 year duration um, at Goddard. I specifically focused on four um, MMS, which is, which studies um, uh, the Earth's magnetosphere. I'll be talking about uh, GPM, which is a combined project with JAXA, one of my favorite projects, which is a series of weather satellites. Um, James Webb, which is actually my absolute favorite. I have the lapel pin here because it's my absolute favorite satellite. Um, and we're, we have great plans for it going up in the next uh, year or a few years. Um, I'll be talking about uh, Hermes or Lunar Gateway, which is the which is part of the Artemis program's uh, uh, plan to go back to the, to the moon. And currently, how I've stepped away from integrating satellites to now um, being more of uh, on the defense side of of defending satellites from from um, um, physical threats in orbit, as well as uh, cyber threats via hacking. Um, so that's really interesting, really cool stuff. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of be, again, touching on these uh, throughout the conversation. So again, thank you so much for having me. And I'm truly, truly honored to be here. Um, I hope before I get into it again, I hope you guys can't, can't see how tired I am. Like I was telling the conference organizers, I just had my first child um, this past weekend. Uh, absolutely amazing experience. We got home last night, my time around um, 7 p.m. So thank you so much. It's been about, um, you know, 12, 13 hours or so. <laughs> and and he, he's not sleeping at all, but I'm glad, I'm glad I was able to, I'm glad I'm able to be here with you guys today. Um, so stepping back, if you, <clears throat> if you follow me, stepping back in time uh, to when I was 16 years old, I was a sophomore, yeah, sophomore, sophomore high school. Um, actually, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a step back further to a year before that, when I was 15 years old, um, I was an absolute knucklehead, <laughs> and my um, my mom my mom always told me, "Hey, you need to, <clears throat> you know, get get a summer job. You need to do X Y Z. You can't, you know, go play soccer outside with your friends all summer like I was doing constantly year after year." Uh, and I said, "Okay, mom, I'll get a job." Um, and you know, true to true to my word, true to being a, a teenager, I said I would do it, and I did not do it. <clears throat> and the only thing that was available for me after, after um, when, when the summer started was to be a janitor at a local high school. So, so for that whole high, for that whole summer, I, I cleaned, I cleaned uh, desks, I cleaned bathrooms, I cleaned lockers out. It was, it was such a humbling experience. What I got from that was work ethic. What I got from that was being on time to things. And, and it was such an, such a, uh, a humbling experience for me that I, I, I learned, uh, you know, when I say I'm, a, I'm going to do something, I immediately do it. I follow up on it. Um, so that's one of the kind of lessons I took from those, those early, you know, that early <laughs> opportunity to work as a janitor and kind of clean these, 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 these schools out before school started again. Um, so anyway, jump forward to uh, when I was 16. <clears throat> Got an amazing opportunity following uh, working at a, 
at NASA summer camp um, where, where the leaders of the high school internship program uh, basically reached out and said, hey, we're forming this new cohort. We'd like you to be a part of it. Um, I applied, I was accepted, uh, and I started working on a project called MMS, which is the Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission, which again studies the Earth magnetic uh, fields. It's a set of four tetrahedral satellites that um, will, will basically weave in and out of these fields to help us understand space weather. And back, um, you know, when I was working on this, 2008, 2009, um, we were again setting up to do more space exploration because at the end of the day, we want to understand uh, the environment of space and how we can um, send people even further. So this was, this was it, was, it was an early mission, but this was one of the earlier missions in my career that, um, you know, is constantly, constantly set up as building blocks. During my time on MMS, I worked in the radiation lab. I saw a question, which is harder kids are, uh, rocket science. <laughs> um, I'm not that. I'm not that experienced with kids, so I'm. I'm gonna say kids. <laughs> I'm gonna say kids at this point because he. He. He has uh, obviously a mind of his own. He's like, I'm gonna wake up at two and two thirty to eat, and you can't sleep uh, any time between anything. So again, I'm running on two or three hours of sleep. But it, again, it's an amazing experience so far. I've been a dad for two, three days, how long was he going, one, two, three, yeah, three days, three days now, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world, but working on MMS, I had the opportunity to work in um, the radiation department, so uh, at, uh, I didn't, I didn't talk about this, but NASA Goddard Space Flight Center is the NASA location um, located in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, um, so the east coast of the United States, it's, uh, it is one of the, it's unique to NASA because it's one of the science centers, but it also holds the largest, um, one of the largest uh, clean rooms in North America. Um, so where, where, we, where we design those really, really big satellites, they typically go to NASA to this clean room we call the SISTIF, um, so that these different satellites can get integrated um, into one because it's, a, it's one of the only clean rooms that can hold something of that, of that magnitude. So um, working on MMS, uh, I wasn't in that clean room. I was in a radiation lab, which is just, it's the bottom floor of this basement that they basically renovated to be a radiation chamber and they simulate um, radiation space environments in this chamber. <laughs> so like we'll build, we'll build components, um, we'll build components and then we'll, we'll pump the chamber full of gamma rays or what have you and, uh, and, and see how those components react um, when, under, when under these, these different testing environments. We'll take that test data and then we'll then build the actual satellite uh, which eventually goes into space. Um, but this this environment is such a critical critical part in understanding how your satellite will um, react in these environments because you don't want to send something up and then just have it you know immediately uh, shorted out by either radiation or or what have you. Um, and I realize again I realize this is a tech conference so I can kind of go into the technical jargon of things, um, but I'm still trying to not overstep that line at all. Um, but but radiation the radiation chamber was 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 um, my first experience and. And you know we were testing a number of components, but most of them was for the um, the actual instrument box that um, that worked that works for MMS. And come to find out, uh, two or three years later, I found out that you know some components that kind of snuck uh, snuck into our testing phase were actually used on the um, Mars Curiosity rover. So that was that was actually really cool. To you know they said, hey, this launched, and and oh, we tested part you know B twelve seven oh six just a random serial number, for example. Um, and that series of satellites actually went into testing the uh, an identical um, uh, ice box on on the Mars rover. So that was that was actually really cool to say. Oh, I worked on a project went to Mars because <laughs> all my projects have been you know um, centric around either the Earth, the Sun, um, or James Webb, which is an L two. Um, so so MMS that's my first experience, and that was one of my first uh, um, experiences um, being integrated with with a mentor. Uh, outside of my immediate family that actually um, wanted to wanted to uh, pour into me and wanted me to have the absolute best. Uh, that sounds so much like a origin story of a suit. It is, it, it is. <laughs> like what happens if we go into the chamber and, and you know, the radiation leaks and now, yeah, it's, it's a whole thing. Um, so so um, my, my mentor, uh, Anthony Sanders, Anthony Sanders was my mentor. And this, this guy was an absolute, uh, absolute rock star at NASA. Um, he, he, you know, he, he helped to guide me in my, in my early stages. Again, um, 
I was only I was a teenager in high school. I didn't I didn't know really anything about engineering. I remember the most I wanted to do was it was around this time that um it was around this time that um Transformers was was coming out. Transformers the the movie was coming out. So, you know, I was like, hey, I want to build that. I I want to build a transformer, literally. Like that's what I thought engineering was. Or I thought engineering was some form of like um, you know, taking you know, anything, for example, like taking your phone and catting it or something like that. Um, and so I was interested in drawing. I was interested in the arts and I was interested in kind of that, that sci-fi kind of thing. So, you know, that's what, that is one of the things that drew me to our engineering. And, and, and Anthony really helped me to tap into that um, and to tap my skill set even more. And it was just uh, an amazing experience to say, to say the absolute least. Um, MMS is still in orbit now, collecting data. Uh, if you go to, you know, if you just Google NASA MMS, it takes you to the homepage, tells you some some public data that's out on the satellite tells you how long it's been in orbit. It tells you, um, you know, really just how it was built in general. And again, oh, fun fact. This is a really fun fact, actually. The um, So when I worked on MMS in radiation, my dad at the same time worked MMS, but he worked the mechanical side of things. So two separate, two completely separate departments. Um, he worked um, the mechanical side. So the mechanical side that designed the housing for the structures and design the um, the 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 like moving structure. So when you're moving the satellite back and forth, um, cool thing about that satellite is it's actually uh, shaped like an octagon. I believe it's an octagon. Um, so there's four it's four octagons stacked on top of each other. Um, during the time that they designed the satellite, my dad was actually designing our um, our deck. Like he built a deck on the back of our house. And so when they were in the design phases of this, um, of this project, he said, hey, why don't we use this same structure that I'm building on the back of my house right now? So fun fact, MMS is in the same shape as the deck on the back of my, my parents' old house, which again is an octagon, but, but it, so it's not a revolutionary shape, but it's, it's just a fun story that I get to tell people that, you know, he was in that meeting, he decided on that. So that's something, and he's got this really, really cool, um, you know, module of it. Um, at the house and it's just you know a scale version and I, I try to get it from every time I go to the house like hey can I have that I just need to like set it up on my on my setup back here um so um let's see MMS so we we move forward from MMS again high schooler uh working throughout my my uh ninth and tenth grade year at high school in high school um these are summer internships at this point so every summer I'm going back um year after year just to learn as much as I can and lucky enough for me I went, I went to school right down the street at Eleanor Roosevelt High School, um, which is literally a 20 minute walk from NASA. So I was extremely fortunate to, to have that. So after, after school, I'll be able to go to center. My mentor would sign me in and he would allow me to spend, you know, an hour, an hour and a half, just, it, it, you know, finishing things up in the summer. And this is a completely voluntary position, but I decided to trade those evenings you know, um, playing soccer, playing basketball, playing baseball, um, playing video games. I, I traded those evenings or some of those evenings um, to go back and learn more. And I realized that's because I, I then had a love for it. And that love was rooted in the fact that I had mentors that were continuously pushing me forward. Um, so I, I always make it a point to say in any, in any setting that I speak that, um, your story is unique. You have no idea how you're going to impact the next generation in some way. And so I encourage you to constantly go out there, constantly tell your story. Um, but, but anyone that's seeking to enter the field, anyone that needs guidance, I, I, I urge you to, to be that support system for them because you don't know if you're going you're gonna to meet a 16-year-old hard-headed kid that's going to stay at NASA or stay, with their, or stay in the industry for the next 12 years and, and, and you know, try to impact the world as much as he or she can. Um, so mentorship is huge for me. That was kind of a step left. Um, but mentorship is absolutely huge for me. And there, there is, um, and that's really what, what my entire career has been rooted in. So moving on from MMS, I spent a lot of time on that. We'll get into uh, GPM, which is the Global Precipitation Measurement Satellite. It is a combined um, satellite uh, mission between NASA and JAXA. And we, we all know what JAXA is, Japan, um, Japan's Aerospace Exploration Agency. Um, this project is capable of, I forgot the message on it, but it's capable of 
uh, uh, predicting or not predicting of um, updating us on our data for global precipitation fall every every three three minutes. I want to say three minutes, three hours, one of the two. Um, and just that in itself allows us to get a lot more accurate weather data when it comes to will it rain today, will it snow today, X, Y, Z. And it's part of the overall weather suite of where a lot of people around the world get their, get their weather data. So, you know, you open the Weather Channel app, you open even the weather app on your iPhone, like most people have, or, or I, I don't know, I'm, a, I'm an Apple guy. I don't know if Androids have that. But yeah, so, so um, yeah, even if you open the, if you, even if you open the app, uh, you'll see the, the public version of the data that comes from satellites like that. Um, and GPM, working on GPM was my first experience working, <laughs> working on, I'm glad Android has it as well, working on, um, working on uh, the mechanical aspects of the satellite. And, and, and that was under uh, uh, my mentor, Alfonso Stewart. He was, again, another absolute rock star at NASA. He, he was the deployables expert. So I was able to work under him, um, working on the, the, I always say this wrong, working on the mechanical boom hinge for the solar array panels for uh, GPM. And this in a normal, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a normal presentation where I had a slide deck, this is where I flash you the image of, of um, GPM. But imagine for me, you just have, I'm going to do it like this. So imagine you just have a box like this and off the side of the box, it's just a boom hinge and attached to that is, you know, however many panels, five, I mean, four, six panels, however many panels um, you need for your specific satellite. So the, 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 the satellite boom hinge is, is basically an elbow joint in order to, for it to deploy from once it gets into orbit. So the elbow joint for the solar ray panels and its additional mechanisms is what I designed and built um, for GPM along with Alfonso Stewart. Maybe, maybe, maybe the deployables at NASA are a little different. <laughs> so, so um, deployables in terms of you, you, um, you pack up your satellite, you pack up your satellite in a rocket or in, in, you know, whatever, and you launch it into space and when it gets into space, it unfolds, basically unfolds into, you know, a transformer in a sense, if you want to think about it like that, it, it unfolds into a, it unfolds into a transformer. Um, because you can't launch satellites in their correct orientation in some way they have um, mechanisms, yep. A me mechanism is a bit more. Um, is it? Is it? Is is mechanisms are necessary in order for it to get to its its absolute large size. Um, so yeah, got to definitely work on the transformer. So that dream that I had as a teenager, it was coming to life. You know, three years later, still in high school, <laughs> still in high school, coming to coming to fruition. Um, so at this point, I am a senior in high school. It was my senior year of working on GPM. Um, uh, a cool story I like to tell about Alfonso is um, he, again, absolute brilliant guy, knew so much about the industry, knew so much about GPM in particular in the mechanical aspects, the deployables aspects, things of that nature. Um, there was a time where the, the, the um, solar ray panels, uh, like I said, they fold. They just fold kind of like, um, they fold uh, kind of like, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, but, uh, but, um, a sliding door almost, but not a, not a sliding door. Uh, yes, a map, that's a perfect example. It folds up, it folds up like a map, um, it, you know, long ways like a map and it folds kind of like that. And then it deploys um, to six panels. Um, in order to simulate the deployment process, you obviously have to suspend the bar that the panels are on. And so we have a NASA, these little, um, uh, uh, we call them like footers that that basically have holes at the bottom of them and you apply a small, uh, well, a large airflow and it pushes the footer off the ground and thus suspends the panel. So it's able to float in the in that third dimension. Um, so the thing about that is that we had to use a surface that wasn't gonna provide friction for the airflow and that was completely smooth. So <laughs> so NASA NASA said, hey, let's go forward. Let's, let's build this thing. Let's, um, let's do it on this flat surface um, with it's completely smooth, completely flat surface. And it was, um, it was, so, it was somewhere upwards of $1.2 million just for this, just for this floor. <laughs> and, and I, I could be wrong with that, but it was, it was a really high number just for the floor, just to test this one aspect. And, you know, Alfonso came back and said, Oh, there's, there's a lot of different other aspects and, and different flooring that we could use just to do this. So 
he, I'll never forget. He goes on to um, he goes on to like a local hardware store. So either you know around here it's Home Depot or Lowe's or what have you, and he basically orders like this this vinyl this vinyl flooring that's just completely smooth but orders like this gigantic roll of it <laughs> and and brings it in and you know comparing it to what we we're going to order it, you know it checks out it checks out all the um the the things we needed to it passed recommendations i mean requirement standards and all our codes and stuff like that so we end up using this gigantic you know vinyl floor that that or laminate floor that was essentially you know upwards of two three hundred dollars <laughs> and you know when you think of the margin of how much money you saved on something like that that example is something that made me think outside the box when it comes to um how i approach different problems um you know it doesn't have to be the traditional approach you can and two things it doesn't have to be the tra traditional approach and you also don't have to um be so sure on your answer that that you you're not confident enough to say it, if that makes sense um, so, you know, if you have a brilliant idea or you think it's a brilliant idea, I say, go ahead and go ahead and say it. If you're wrong, you're wrong. It's, it, it's not the end of the world if you're wrong. Um, and so many people are, are, or so many people I've encountered are just, you know, nervous about, um, sharing their ideas because they're scared of, they're scared of it, um, being rejected. They're scared of, uh, you know, being looked down upon because their idea wasn't quote unquote as good or, or didn't fit X, Y, Z. Um, but that that's a different story for a different day. I encourage you, uh, anyone listening to, to pursue your ideas, to say them out loud um, and, and keep those creative juices flowing. Uh, you know, a lot of young engineers in the field now, uh, you know, just go to the older ones and say, how do I do it? And they, they tend to lose that creative nature. And another, uh, and I see your question, uh, another um, story about Alfonso is when I first met him um, and we were developing the elbow hinge, uh, I, again, I, I had done two internships at NASA. This was my third, my first mechanical experience. Um, and my first experience with something that would deploy in space, he said, okay, what do you want to basically build this thing out of? Um, and I said, I have no idea what I want to build it out of. So he, he put these, um, he had, he had catted these, these six CAD. So you, uh, this is a technical conference. You guys know what CAD is. So he catted these, these six blocks, um, six blocks. Uh, and they were just different shapes. So, so wood, aluminum, aluminum alloy, uh, titanium, uh, metal. I said wood already. Metal. Um, just different, different materials. And he puts them in front of me and says, "Which one do you want to build the satellite out of?" Um, and he he says, "Figure out which one you want to build the satellite out of." And he walks out the room, like just leaves. <laughs> and so I'm left just to my thoughts of, "What do you build a satellite out of? What what are the thoughts that go into it? Is it you know weight?" dimensions how easy it is it is it to um you know shape and mold into what you need and that was a that was one of the experience i had with offhand mentoring that allowed me to think through a lot of the um you know a lot of the situations that i've encountered uh, along my career uh you're obviously a high achiever how do you how do you protect yourself from burning out while constantly staying on top of your game um Without going on a tangent, that is really a t uh, really a question of uh, time management. Um, I actually do a lot outside of engineering. I um, I'm now a father, so I can add that to the list. I'm a dad. Um, I'm running for a uh, public office within Maryland, so the the school board of education running to be on that. I am a full time doctoral student. Um, I I operate I operate a nonprofit organization. Um, I'm a husband. Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of like a part-time photographer. I used to do wedding photography as well. It's all about, um, and, and all those things outside of engineering really helped me to, to, um, stay, stay grounded. I'll say it, it, and it helps me be well-rounded because engineering, I love engineering, but at the end of the day, I want everyone to know that it's more than just engineering. You know, I have a full, I have a, I have a life outside of it. I love to travel. I love to eat. <laughs> I really love to eat. I love to, um, you know, explore new places. And it's just, it's just an amazing experience, but to not, to not burn out, um, is, is, uh, is, is just think of time management and you have, Oh, this is important. You have to know when to say no, <laughs> you, you absolutely have to, you can't, you cannot do everything. <laughs> you have to say no to certain things. Um, and, and, you know, just have, just think it through and it's, and it's okay to say no. And, you know, opportunities will come and go, but that, that's what I say is most important. Um, is a satellite part made of wood a feasible option? No, 
No, it's not, not at all. But, but in terms of like, um, so the point of the blocks where to basically show the weight difference um, as well as the textural difference um, of these materials. So wood is not, <laughs> wood is not something that, that I would suggest by any means, but he, he just had these series of blocks that, that was there for, te I found out now, now I, I know it's a teaching purpose and he uses it for all his mentees. But at my time, at, at that time I was new, I was a mentee, well, I was selling a mentee, but I was young and he was doing what he does in terms of the mentorship. Um, uh, yeah, you yeah, know, it's, it's not, <laughs> those two questions. Not. Um, so we want GPM, uh, talked about Alfonso. Uh, let me, let me get to, I'll get to, I'll get to James Webb. Cause I feel like James Webb and then Lunar Gateway are really like the two more interesting ones that everyone wants, wants to hear about. Okay, so for those of you that do not know about James Webb, um, James Webb is uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is the follow up to the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, what can I say about it? Uh, it is a $13 billion satellite <laughs> that has been built over the past decade plus. Um, its goal, or when it's operational, it'll fly in an L2 orbit. Um, L2 orbits are 1.5 kilometers, 1.5 million kilometers. 1.5 kilometers is not far. 1.5 million kilometers uh, from the Earth. Um, and will be pointed outward toward, outward toward um, the vast, the vastness of space. Uh, Kenny, are you involved in software development at NASA? And if yes, can you tell a few words about NASA's QA processes in the field of software? Yes. Um, and then I'll get back to James Webb. Uh, software development, right after James Webb, and a, a project I wasn't going to talk about was um, JPSS was the Joint Polar Satellite System. It's part of that weather satellite suite that GPM is actually a part of. Um, but this one has instruments on it that help us monitor natural disasters. So for example, the VIRS instrument on JPSS helped us to um, track Hurricane Dorian, which was a hurricane off the, um, off the east coast of America last year, helps to track the Australian wildfires, helped us to track the Amazon rainforest fires, as well as a number of other um, natural disasters on a global, on a global scale. These, these, um, these tracking patterns that, that the satellite kind of spit out helped to ultimately save lives, help for um, first responders to know what to do and, and to assess their situation. So again, that's a really cool project that you, I encourage you to um, look into. My, my role on that project was I was the lead database engineer um, and you guys are software folks. So um, basically making the, the, the database, so the brain of the satellite um, that, that enabled it to get uh, command and telemetry um, you know, from the ground system. So not to get too into that, but, but the software aspect of that, we designed it um, for the first iteration, J1 designed it, uh, uh, what was it, XML, XML stole, um, but now it's transitioned more to so like the Python type, um, type uh, uh, of coding for, for um, I'm trying not to say too much <laughs> of, of coding. So, um, so we, so the database, the database is formed and either written in our, our, it's either written by our instrument vendors or our spacecraft vendors, which is kind of that air, the Astro RT um, Eclipse kind of format, which is the, which is the, um, the ground system or the system our ground, our ground folks use. Um, and then that database is integrated into satellite, which eventually allows us to communicate and control it, you know, get that tel telemetry, get that command, or even make it do a backflip or stuff like that while it's in orbit, which is pretty cool. Um, and so the QA processes. Um, so the QA process within the um, software realm of things, specifically at NASA, um, each project is different. It's not, I mean, there are general guidelines for, you know, satellite development, but each individual project is different. A, because of the orbit or fly-in, B, because of the interfaces it'll have on it. Um, for example, when I get into talking about um, that satellite defense stuff um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the uh, cyber threats that come that can impact Hermes or Lunar Gateway and things like that. That satellite has different interfaces than JPSS has. Um, so with the, you, you, like, that's just an example of how things might be a little different um, 
from process to process. But but I can't I can't really get into it a whole lot. I just I, I know I know particularly that they are it does vary from project to project. Do you have some standard components used in different satellite projects? Uh, yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, what's a what's a really really standard component that we use? Um, semiconductors are really are really common, but those are it's just an electronic component. Um, let's see. Uh, a lot of the interface I deal with. Oh, let me let me. I'll I'll address that as I talk about James Webb. So we'll talk about the components. James Webb L two orbit. 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth, um, um, and and it's pointed outward. It's a pole, it, it has a series of infrared sensors or cameras on board that that you know absolutely blow Hubble's out of the water. Um, so if you've seen any photos of um, any photos that Hubble has created, uh, one of the most famous ones are uh, what is it called Eagle Nebula or Pillars of Creation. Um, it's basically this huge dust cloud that Hubble photographed in, in uh, the 1990s, 1995, 1995. Um, and, and you see kind of just that, that, that pillar, that dust, that dust and ga gas cloud. And around it, you see a handful of stars. And that is vis that's the visible light. The concept behind James Webb is to account for the red shifting that happens as the universe constantly expands. So James Webb is essentially a Stick with me. James Webb is eventually a time machine. This time machine allows us to see back to stars in its first, in their first, um, you know, their first moments, their first, I was, I was going to say the first twinklings, but I felt, I felt like that was too corny. Their first, their first moments of shining, essentially. Um, so as the universe constantly expands, light shifts more um, toward, to it, light shifts more in a phenomenon we know is red shifting. Um, so the idea behind pointing Hubble into, point, flying Hubble out, and, oh my God, flying James Webb out and pointing it into the darkness, darkness of space allows us to, A, knock out the light that comes from the earth, the sun, um, you know, uh, uh, other bodies that might be in the way, um, and B, allows us to have the satellite pointed, again, away from the sun on the cold side and to see more of that light in its in its initial states. So if you think of, again, the Eagle Nebula, you are, you are seeing even the brightest star there. You're seeing that, that star as it was, uh, you know, billions of years ago. Um, but through James Webb, you might see the star shining either a bit less because it's less developed or, you know, shining or shining not at all. Because, or not, not shining, not at all. Oh, yeah, not shining not at all because it, maybe, it, maybe it wasn't formed at that time. So we, so, so, I said that backwards. So you'd see you'd see stars shining in spots that you didn't for Hubble because they weren't they they either they could have they they weren't formed at that time. Um, so the idea behind James Webb is to act as a time machine or a time telescope <laughs> that will allow us to see back and see some of the first lights that were created, um, the first galaxies, and and through that it helps us to um, address uh, how galaxies form, how galaxies shift, how galaxies and stars die and things of that nature. And it's really going to help us, ex it, you know, expand our understanding of the universe as it is a whole. Um, what else can I say? Um, oh, uh, again, again, other than uh, JPSS, I also encourage you to Google, if, if you Google um, um, NASA Hubble uh, Eagle Nebula, um, infrared light versus visible light, you'll see the visible picture probably on the left and the infrared picture will be on your right. And you can see the, the, the comparison of the stars just in that photo alone. James Webb, so you can imagine James Webb has infrared cameras just like Hubble, but the infrared cameras are significantly more powerful. It covers, um, uh, what is it, mid-infrared mid as, as well as, um, as, well as near-infrared are on, are on that project. So we're hoping to get a lot of good information, see a lot, lot, lot more stars, and to understand um, where we're going with that. But my, my portion on James Webb was I was one of the um, uh, deputy lead integration engineers for uh, the IEC component, which is the electronic component. I'm glad you looked it up, which are the electronic component for um, <clears throat> James Webb. So for those that don't know, James Webb uh, is combined into uh, several subsystems. The two that I, the two that I was mainly kind of uh, working around were, was OTE, and this is OTE, which is just the gold, 
quote unquote gold mirrors. They're really not gold, they're beryllium, but quote unquote gold mirrors that allow, uh, uh, you know, that, that are the, the mirrors that, that allow us to get our data and things of that nature. On the back side of it is this rectangular box that includes all of the instruments um, for the project, which is known as ISOM. Um, and when you combine uh, OTE and ISOM, you get OTIS, O-T-I-S, OTIS. <laughs> and, and so that was like the first, the first major, one of the first major integrations of the satellite. And that's the complete part that sits on the top. Within the instrument components in the back, there's a uh, electronic components box that we, that we basically um, um, plugged in, for lack of a more scientific term, plugged into the satellite that allows, um, again, our instruments, uh, instrument data to flow, um, our power to flow. It connects to um, uh, uh, the thermal and like the cooling system and things like that. Um, so in terms of standard components for, again, again, satellites, we used, we, a lot of stuff that's, that was kind of not customized for James Webb was, had to be the adapters. The adapters were pretty, pretty standard, just, you know, um, you know, uh, 32 pins, uh, uh, eight pins, things like that. Just when it comes to um, technical or not technical, but when it comes to the actual hardware that went into the system. Um, ICE boxes, I say, are pretty unique from instrument to instrument, but at their heart, they have they have generally the same kind of components. Um, there's a lot of times at NASA where, or NASA or other contract companies like the one I work for, where we will, we will grab um, the standard parts. You just call off the shelf parts. Um, that again, it's a technical conference. I don't have to say that off the shelf parts that we can um, that we, we use a lot of off the shelf parts um, sometimes. And it, and you know, a if that's cost effective, um, and b we know that that part already has been tested. So. We'll test it in terms of we know that it works. So we won't have to design it, fabricate it, test it to make sure it conceptually works, and then test it to make sure that it actually works for our specific satellite. So it ultimately saves time. Um, so I, I think I think that's more of a general question. Yeah, we, we like to use off the shelf parts as well. I'm curious about planning for any repairs that may need done for James Webb. Hubble requires shuttle base repairs. How will this work for James Webb given this position? Excellent question. Um, again, uh, if I had the slide deck, this is where I'd have a slide. Um, Hubble has a servicing hatch. Again, Hubble is 500, 500 kilometers um, from, from Earth in a, a relatively low orbit. Um, this servicing hatch was put on it because, again, it's within reach. James Webb does not have a servicing hatch. <laughs> once, once it's out there, once it's 1.5 plus uh, uh, kilometers out there, it's, it's out there. And I think that's really why, that's really one of the reasons where, why our project is taking its time when it comes to launching this, this amazing vehicle, because again, we, we, we can't really um, um, afford, afford slip ups. We can't really afford mistakes with it because again, it's this huge tennis court sized transformer that we're sending into space out of our reach and it's not cost effective to thus go and repair it. Um, and, and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of some give and take on it because, you know, it, it's, James Webb isn't the first satellite to fly in an L2 orbit. There are other satellites in an L2 orbit, but the general concept behind putting something in an L2 orbit is that it's going to live and die in that orbit. Um, let's see, what does the software architecture of a satellite look like? I do not know. I'll be honest with you. I don't know outside of um, outside of the database aspect of things. Um, that's a that's a tougher question. Um, I know, I know in terms of um, satellite defense for for cybersecurity reasons, which again I'm not allowed to really go into. But that's kind of the jit. That's kind of the most I know about the software architecture. So sorry, I can't answer that a bit further. Um, what kind of bandwidth do you have to? What kind of bandwidth do you have to something that's 1.5 million kilometers away? How much data can you transmit, receive from it per day? Again, a good question. Um, that's a question for, because on James Webb, I was on the integration, um, the integration and development team. Um, there's a separate team for, you know, our flight controllers. And then there's another, even another separate team that deals with the data that we actually get. So I'm actually, you know, two steps removed from, um, controlling the satellite uh, and L2 orbits in terms of receiving telemetry and stuff from L2 orbits is something that I don't understand. 
I understand it from um, Leo orbits or even the orbit that uh, JPSS flies in because we had to do, um, we had to get our information from ground station and stuff like that all the time. Um, so, you know, the closest satellites, I understand L2 orbit is a, is a new concept to me. Um, and I haven't really dove, delved into that too much. Um, what are the future trends for satellite technology for commercial use? Um, as you know, commercial use is becoming a really big thing um, throughout uh, the world, really. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good thing. I'll say if everyone, you know, adheres to these different requirements and, and things that are set in place for the, for the, um, the benefit of those that will go explore, you know, keeping astronauts in and different explorers from different countries safe and things like that, it should be of the top priority. I know something that if you didn't hear, um, when you think, sat when I think satellite, I think, I think um, more than just those that orbit, I think also the, the projects that will go and land on different planets or different bodies and things like that. So a really, a really cool thing that, again, you can look up is um, in July of this year, July, yeah, July of this year, NASA and JAXA signed an agreement to, um, to, to, for JAXA to help build the next generation of um, habitable lunar vehicles. And, and believe it or not, I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to give you guys a guess. If, if those that do not know the answer to this and are guessing, um, they partnered with a car company to help build the next generation of lunar vehicles. Put in the chat what you think, which car company you think they partnered with to build the next generation of lunar vehicles. Again, a hint. It is a partnership between NASA and JAXA. Um, let's see, another... Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Can you read SF books playing in space? I would expect... I would expect, sorry, I'm losing your question now. Can we read SF books playing in space? I would expect that you recognize a lot of things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's uh, it, 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 like reading books or seeing videos, even movies, you kind of, you tend to point things out and kind of be picky about, that's not right. That's not how that happened. <laughs> and, and it's funny, I, I do that with my wife literally all the time. Um, and funny enough, my wife is on the, um, the software side of things. Um, so I should understand a lot more about software, but I don't <laughs> just like, you know, she doesn't understand a whole lot about integration and mechanical things. Um, when it, uh, yeah. So, so L2, it, the, 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 um, the servicing of, of, uh, web is, is still up in the air. We don't know if we'll, um, we don't know if we're going to push it out or if it's going to, if it's going to live in L2 more than likely it'll live in L2 just because at some point we hope to have the technology to be able to, I would, I would, if I was them, I would someday hope to have the technology once James Webb is no longer active to be able to retrieve it or retrieve a small part of it, just to have it. Um, who owns space? Can anyone place a satellite out there? Uh, so no one owns space. Um, there are agreements out there that, that say that space is a communal place. And that's one of the, um, that's one of the actually main, main problems moving forward with, with commercialization. I'm getting back to that question is that, um, is that space is very, very, very cluttered. Like the orbits are very cluttered. Um, and because it's a, because it's free domain, no one takes responsibility to clean up this space. Um, so when you think of commercial, when you think of, again, when you think of a certain company that wants to launch autonomous satellites to weave through these different orbits, you know, we, it makes us a little nervous <laughs> because no one's flying it. <laughs> and, and we, you know, we have, ISS up there, for example. So absolute worst case scenario, you get an autonomous satellite that's flying around up there, bumps into one thing, which bumps to another thing, which could bump into ISS or, you know, it, it's, it's a whole thing. But, you know, the poor thing about our commercialization is that everyone follows the rules and, and you know, we're all moving toward a common goal of exploration. I know we've, we're wrapping up on time here, so I won't be able to get into my last mission, but yes, in terms of commercialization, um, for those that guessed Tesla, that's actually incorrect. I thought it was Tesla too at first before I knew it was, it was a partner with Jackson. So it's actually Toyota. Toyota is helping to build the next generation of uh, habitable lunar vehicles that are going to, its plan is to, it's part of the Artemis Generation Project or Artemis Program. Um, and it's, they're building this, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, the Lunar Cruiser. They're building the Lunar <laughs> the lunar cruiser. They're building the lunar cruiser, which is basically a a habitable lab that will allow astronauts, cosmonauts, people from you know different countries to to 
join in this in this cruiser and go out and explore the moon for up to 14 days. Um, you know, it's got some cool stuff like uh, it's got a, a suit port, which is something that's popular on ISS. It's got a lab in it. It's just got a bunch of stuff that will enable us to have a habit, habitable environment so that we don't have to go back to home base every time to depressurize or things of that nature. Um, there's a newly formed Space Force in the U.S. collaborate closely with NASA, or oh, it's a completely separate. Oh, I can get into that forever. It's it's um it's it's separate. <laughs> it's separate at this point. Um, it's separate at this point because it's so new because it's getting its bearings. I'll say um it's 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 still separate. Uh, uh, the, 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 is there any cooperation with China Chinese or Indian space programs? Um, it's a good question. I don't know entirely. I know there. The ones I know and the ones I've worked with are um, uh, uh, JAXA, um, the, the Germany Space Agency, uh, and therefore Poland Space Agency. Uh, uh, what else? What else? What else? Oh, oh, um, ESA. So the 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 European Space Agency. Um, um, just just uh, a number of them. I don't I don't know anything about the China or Indian. Uh, space programs. I know Africa is is, and I was at a uh, international conference last year where Africa was kind of talking about um, how their plans for developing their space programs. Um, but I think again, I think space, and that's the beauty of being in. I think space is really an international uh, playground of sorts. I don't I don't think, and again, it's good that no one owns space, and it's good to see uh, different co collaborations from different people and different backgrounds to again work toward this um, uh, next era. Of, of space exploration. Um, I imagine that has many standard operating procedures and processes for virtually anything. How do you deal with the balance between playing safe and boring within the framework and getting creative and thinking outside the box, taking risks? Um, again, that's something about being, being very um, comfortable, comfortable in your, in your thoughts, being comfortable in um, saying what you what you uh, need to say when it needs to be said. Um, I will say NASA and certain contractors within the center are very open to to these different ideas, to taking risks within within certain margins. Um, and you're right, there are kind of uh, standard operating procedures, but we know that in order to push the envelope on exploring, you have to push the envelopes on design. You have to take risks that people haven't taken before, and and, you know, if you think back to 50s, 60s, they, you know, those early engineers were taking those risks to to put, you know, a man or a man into space. And now we're pushing the envelope even further to go even further and hopefully to put the first woman on Mars. Um, so, you know, taking those risks are um, are essential. But I don't think I don't think by any means people should be boxing and, and make themselves thus boring. And I've stopped. I've stopped talking. If you need, if you guys need any more questions or anything like that, I know it's 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 noon here, which means it's it's what six six there. Um, so I don't want to go too much over time. Very quick question: Is that a Lego set I spot? Yeah. So yeah, this, this is a Lego set. It's um, it's the uh, it's a space. What is it? It's a space shuttle. A Lego set. I haven't put it together yet. I actually have a podcast coming up in three weeks where they want me to put that together while I answer like rapid fire questions. So I haven't touched it cause I don't want to cheat, but, but it's, um, it's over there. So I, I, I'll be doing that podcast um, probably in the next three weeks or so. Would I go to space? Yes, I will go to space. Actually this past March when um, NASA opened their pool for applicants for the space program, I actually applied um, obviously because COVID-19, everything has kind of been taking a step back. So we've been given, um, given orders to to kind of wait um until next early spring late summer to find out what's what's going to happen do i play space engineers or a Kerbal space program i don't there is a follow-up question here would you go into space even now <laughs> you have a kid? oh man um that's a tough question and and <laughs> i was talking to my wife about that i would um i'd, I'd go I'd go on um, shorter, shorter missions. So the missions like the ISS or even a mission to the moon where, you know, max, you might be gone for a month, two months. Uh, but the ones, the ones out to Mars and stuff like that, probably, probably not. Unless, unless when that happens, he's like an adult, <laughs> then sure thing. But like during these early phases where he's, you know, he's learning to walk, learning to crawl, learning to, you know, eat, 
eat, just basic motor functions. I don't want to miss moments like that. And I hope, I hope you guys can hear like two minutes ago, he started crying. So <laughs> it kind of scared me. I was like, what's that? Oh yeah, I'm a dad now. 